All right, uh, let's do this chat. So who's, who's heard of uh, Olaf Palme before? You're about to. How's Japan trip? Japan was great. You can check out yesterday's VOD. I went through the whole trip. At 11.15 p.m. on February 28th, 1986, Ooh, so in downtown Stockholm, longtime Prime Minister of Sweden, Olaf Palme, and his wife, Lisbeth, left the Grand Cinema and began walking down Sveavagen Avenue to a nearby subway station to catch a train home. They had no security detail. The Prime Minister often preferred to go among the public as if he were an ordinary citizen. Batman's Passing dead. the Adolf Frederick Church, they crossed to the east side of the street and continued heading south. They paused to look in a shop window, but only briefly. Then, as they crossed the intersection Where were you guys? Tunnel Gotten Alley. died. He insta-died. They shot him. His fucking chest exploded. They shot him with a 357. Even before Mrs. Palma fell to her knees over her husband, Anna Haga stopped at a red light nearby, caught sight of a man collapsed on the sidewalk as a nearby figure dashed into the adjacent alley. Fearing an emergency and being a nursing student herself, she leapt from the car and ran to the man lying on the snow-dusted sidewalk. She saw blood coming from his mouth. This was bad. She reached for his neck, no pulse. She turned him on his back and began chest compressions and attempting mouth-to-mouth. -mouth. Within moments, a man passing in a taxi, Stefan Glantz, joined her efforts. Neither of them had any idea this was the prime minister. This was just an ordinary citizen. After disputing with the victim's wife about the importance of the life-saving efforts, someone else began to try to move the victim's legs, saying he ought to be lying on his side. Anna told him off, saying this man's heart had already stopped. This was all they could do. She was so engrossed in her work, she made no memory of his face. Mm. Lars Jepsen snapped his head over his right shoulder and saw a man on Sveavagen just ahead fall to the ground into his view. He must have been shot. Then footsteps on the opposite side of Tunnelgatten, but some kind of shed obstructed the source of the noise. Lars turned to look over his left shoulder. A glimpse. Someone, it had to be a man, seemed to fumble with something as he ran toward the nearby stairs. Then, quick as he came, he was obscured again. Lars dashed after the man, who was now bounding up the stairs. Before pursuing him further, Lars stopped and looked at the man lying on the ground. He wondered if he should help, but he saw others rushing to do so. It was up to him to chase the shooter. He went to the stairs, but stopped again at the first step. He didn't want to follow too closely. At the top of the stairs, he saw the shooter pause, only for a split second, and glance over his right shoulder before disappearing. Lars ran as fast as he could, but he never caught another certain glimpse of the shooter. So Stig Engstrom only heard one loud pop as he left his office building at 44 Sveavagen. He figured it was a car's exhaust bang, nothing unusual as downtown noise goes. As he proceeded down the street, after attempting to check his watch, he saw a man lying on the ground whom he presumed to be a passed out drunk. A woman was on her knees beside him, asking for someone to call an ambulance. A young man and so, woman hovered so Chad, over him. This head. pink guy is, now that they took down the, stopped trying to figure it out, they said he was the most likely one they found to have actually done it. Because everything he said was like, nothing checks out. But uh, he also doesn't really fit in other ways. And then he saw the blood coming from the yep. man's mouth. Now he knew something was wrong. The older woman said he was shot and the killer had run down Tunnelgotten. Engstrom looked down that way and saw the silhouette of a figure standing there against a lighted wall, looking in their direction. He looked back at the body on the ground, then back down Tunnelgotten. The man was gone. Then he tried to help turn the victim on his side to help drain the blood away, but he was already dead. 
Except Engstrom's story changed. Ah, here we go. A lot. In fact, his behavior became so bizarre and untrustworthy, he eventually became a suspect in Palma's murder. In 2020, Swedish police even pronounced with certainty that he was the murderer. But Engstrom committed suicide in 2000. With nobody to put on trial, after nearly 35 years of active investigation into the murder of one of Europe's most controversial Cold War era leaders, the police this? closed the case. Yeah, no, they and closed. They finally closed the case. So fucking expensive, and they could never figure out who did it. Who really killed Olaf Palma remains a mystery. I wasn't born, chat. Of course, to understand why someone would want to kill Olaf Palma, we need to know what he was wearing. Check the police report. Swag. It's accurate. We also need to know what kind of guy he was. So who was Olaf Palma? In short, he was a man of contradictions. Born in 1927 to a wealthy conservative family, Palma would go on to become one of the most consequential social democratic politicians in Swedish history an aristocrat turned champion of the working class. Moreover, as a young man, when he traveled to America, he would spend a year studying at a fine I liberal arts switch. college before bumming it across the country as a hitchhiker. By the way, that school he went to, Kenyon College, pretty cool. Not that we're biased or anything. What? Anyways, to Palma, America was both it. an inspiration, possessing a remarkable spirit of equality and openness, and a cautionary Probably tale, some nod on the as inequality and racism showed the perils of failing to commit fully to one's ideals. But his travels didn't end there. In Eastern Europe, he grew to despise Soviet totalitarianism, and in Southeast Asia, he saw the colonized peoples of the world demanding recognition of their rights to self-determination. As he returned to Sweden, Palma knew one thing very clearly. The Sweden which raised him which chose neutrality in World War II, and the Sweden which existed today, which chose silence in the Cold War, could no longer be tolerated. If Sweden wanted to practice politics of equality at home, it had to start doing so we on have the stage, equality at home. standing up for the downtrodden not just domestically, but internationally. As luck would have it, political opportunity fell right into his lap. As in 1951, Palma happened to meet then-Prime Minister Taga Erlander, on a chance train ride as he was traveling ah, home back to the alone case. and among the ordinary folk, as social democratic politicians so often did. Erlander was immediately impressed with Palma, and soon enough, Palma was the prime minister's Ermlander. personal secretary. Over time, his responsibilities grew, and so did the public's awareness of his contradictions. Here was a social democratic politician campaigning for the everyman, but who was clearly not one of them. He came from a wealthy family for one, but more importantly, Palma was haughty and strident, a man of immense talent and capability, and who wasn't necessarily humble about it. Still, he overcame the criticism and became prime minister in 1969. Immediately, nice. he sought to remake Sweden's foreign policy, abandoning quiet neutrality in favor of an aggressive third way between America and the Soviet Union, a fierce critic of American hypocrisy and Soviet horrors all the same. The hmm. principle was simple the downtrodden of the world, had a friend in Olaf Palma's Sweden. These simple facts inevitably raise the question of equality, of a more equal distribution between countries and within countries. We are beginning to see the outlines of this problem and the consequences, but we are not yet ready to accept the full implications of international solidarity. You tell him. Of course, making such friends brings plenty of enemies. At home, as economic troubles began to worsen, critics regarded Palma as more interested in those suffering outside Sweden than within. Though he led his party to its first defeat in 40 years, only six years later, in 1982, he led a return to power and return to form, making Sweden into the country of support for South Africa's ANC in their fight against apartheid, mm. among other efforts. Palma was a brilliant, difficult man. His aspirations were equality, democracy, and international fraternity, 
but at the same time, he liked the spotlight and was stubborn to a fault. Paradoxically, Palma desperately wanted to be like the people he fought so hard for. So, on that cold February night, Palma dismissed his security guard and set out to see a movie, as if he were just an ordinary citizen. There he goes again. It's a lot of shots now. From the moment Olaf Palma hit the ground, police <laughs> were behind the curve. Multiple witnesses phoned emergency services immediately, but police were late to the crime scene, giving the killer crucial time to escape. Palma took minutes to identify, given Lisbeth's non-responsive state of shock, and at headquarters, police failed to put out a call for additional manpower, while Stockholm wasn't locked down until three hours after the murder. At the crime scene, witness questioning was terribly disorganized. Several key witnesses with crucial testimony were sent home. The police perimeter was too small, and passersby trampled over key evidence, including the bullet used to kill Palma. As time went on, Maverick cops developed their own pet theories. The lead investigator was convinced that a leftist Kurdish group was behind the assassination. Now, this wasn't totally implausible at first, but he held on to it even as it became increasingly clear there was nothing really to go with. This guy was a clown. He even shut down an inquiry into Stig Engstrom, thinking his own theory needed the attention and resources. All this police misconduct snowballed leaving an increasingly cold trail. The murder weapon, determined by ballistics investigations to be a 357 Magnum, was never found. Despite there only being 10 such weapons missing under suspicious circumstances in the entire country. Even as more plausible suspects emerged, the evidence against them was often circumstantial. Capturing the killer started to look more and more unlikely, if not downright impossible. With little in the way of decisive detective work to narrow things down, the list of suspects in Olaf Palma's murder is immense, running the gamut from complete... There's nothing funny up here. Uh, Lester Wow and Pixel Rabbit, thank you guys so much for resub. Hello there, Velho Kala. Good morning, Deathman. What's up, guys? Completely deranged to highly plausible. Usually, intricate theories of tightly organized conspiracies end sperm. up on no, the deranged even. end of the spectrum, but in the case of Olaf Palma, there's one such theory worth considering. The South African connection. Ah. So, the just motive. a random fun fact. You guys know Seth Everman, right? The, the bald music guy. When I was in Stockholm, I, we, I went to the spot where the guy was shot. And I mentioned it to Seth. And he's also, like, really into this case. And this is his favorite theory. He brought this up a bunch. The South African theory. What if is Now simple. you know. Palma was the foremost political figure in the West supporting the fight against apartheid. For South Africa's white supremacist government, killing Palma could do wonders. So when Palma died, a few people did point at South Africa. But it wasn't actually until 1996, 10 years after the murder and two years after Aliens? the end of apartheid, that Go the offline. theory gained any steam. As the new black South African government was sorting through the crimes of the period, a former government agent named Eugene de Kock alleged that <laughs> a spy known to have assassinated a number of anti-apartheid activists' families, Craig Williamson, had orchestrated the Palma murder. Now, de Kock didn't say much else, but independent journalists have pieced together a story. As it goes, Williamson was selected for the job because he'd spent years infiltrating Swedish organizations which supported the ANC. Rather than pulling the trigger, he would keep his hands clean, providing resources and intel to a Swedish middleman who hated Palma and had the connections to recruit someone for the actual dirty work. Enter Bertel Whedon, an avowed Swedish right-winger who worked as a mercenary for Rhodesia's white supremacist government in the 1970s. Williamson and Whedon had met all the way back in 1980, and today stand accused of collaborating on the burglary of anti-apartheid activist offices in London, a charge which, if true, certainly helps paint the picture of these two men as international clandestine criminals. So the South African government has a motive, Hello, Chet, wow. Williamson and Whedon have the means. But what about the opportunity? Means. Here the theory gets a bit murky. Perhaps Whedon recruited a disaffected right-winger to do the job, someone without a lot of experience but with plenty of passion, and naive enough to take the fall if caught. 
Whoever the gunmen, the theory goes, they would have been trailing Palma for some time, finally seen their chance that night after the movie, pulled the trigger, and fled. How does this theory hold up? Well, there's a compelling motive, and Williamson was a serious guy, a bona fide killer. But it's pretty incomplete. Who actually pulled the trigger? There's not really much to say, despite some pretty rigorous journalistic work to figure it out. Not to mention, DeCock's accusation came at a time when former apartheid officials could get amnesty for their crimes by presenting evidence against each other. Now, that's not proof he was lying, but he would have had an incentive to do so. True or not, this theory points to important it. insights about power and identity the core concepts at the heart of Palma's own story and personal contradictions. Williamson spent his entire career working tirelessly to deny recognition to an entire people, literally killing those who stood in his way. Apartheid Some South Africa's guy, intense think too. need to suppress the recognition of millions was a powerful force. One that, force. however unlikely, could have stretched thousands of miles onto a dark Stockholm street in February. I to said this a yesterday man too. Who'd spend his life. I have always thought it was just one random guy who just randomly spotted him that day because if it was like premeditated and organized much better, they 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 would have picked a different opportunity because there were better opportunities doing the opposite. Several early witnesses, including Olaf's son, Martin, testified to seeing someone outside the Grand Cinema before and after the screening and following the Palmas as they left. The search for the so-called Grand Man led police first to Ulf Spinners, a seedy character who claimed to know something about the murder. In turn, they encountered Christer Pedersen, who, mm. as a friend of Spinner's, was able to provide him with an alibi. Interestingly, this was not the first time the police had met with Pedersen. After suffering a traumatic head injury as a young man, Pedersen developed a habit of substance abuse and addiction, and soon began landing himself in more trouble, ultimately stabbing a drug dealer to death in 1970, an event which garnered him prison time and the nickname The Bayonet Killer. But about that alibi, Pedersen claimed Spinners had been staying at his apartment on the edge of town. That evening, Pedersen had taken the train downtown to visit the Oxen Club, which was owned by drug dealer Siga Settergren. He then left the club around 10 p.m., taking the train home to arrive at about 11.30, a plausible timeline given his apartment's distance from central Stockholm. Mm. It all made sense. In fact, this whole group of lowlifes appeared to be a dead end. But after two years of fruitless investigations and a decision to retrace their steps, the police noticed an oversight. They hadn't bothered to ask Settergren if he'd even seen Pedersen that night at the club. So in 1988, the police asked Settergren, who was, ironically, at the tail end of a prison stint, about the affair. As it happens, he hadn't seen Pedersen <gasps> that night at all. He volunteered an explanation for the mix-up. Perhaps Pedersen had wanted to buy some drugs and stopped by Settergren's apartment. He lived near the Grand Cinema. Now they had a suspect. Interesting. So they sought out Ulf Spinners once more, who now disputed the very story which provided him an alibi for the murder, asserting that Pedersen hadn't returned home until 12.30, ample time to have committed the crime. It was time to talk to Pedersen. His alibi didn't change much, but it was now, a couple years later, more detailed. He'd left in the early evening, gone to the Oxen Club, hung out with Settergren and his girlfriend, where, incidentally, he'd signed an affidavit as a witness to their opening a shared bank account, gotten drunk, taken the train home, fallen asleep, passed his stop, and had to go all the way back Oopsie. home, thus explaining his late arrival. Except. Neither Settergren nor his girlfriend testified to seeing Pedersen at the club that night. And that document existed, but was undated. Pedersen just might be their culprit. So the police set up a lineup. A key grand man witness and Olaf Palma's son Martin, who both testified to seeing someone follow the Palmas from the theater, picked out Pedersen, although quite tentatively. Then they called in Lisbeth Palma to view a video lineup. 
She refused to be anywhere near. So they, they line him up and everyone else here works like when the cops or the government or whatever. It's interesting. He's the only one wearing like shitty ass gym shoes. Everyone else is wearing these nice polished shoes. The killer. And she identified Pedersen, stating, middle too. It's evident who it is. That was enough. Krister Pedersen was charged with the murder of Olaf Paul. It was all really rigged. The trial that began in June of 1989 was a disaster for Pedersen. His defense lawyer was unnecessarily confrontational with Lisbeth Palma, who remained a sympathetic figure with the Swedish public. In fact, Pedersen was convicted almost exclusively on the basis of her testimony. However, the conviction wasn't unanimous, and Pedersen was granted was an appeal. Seven. Two months later, citing evidence of Lisbeth Palma's state of shock and unreliability, along with police misconduct in nudging her selection at the lineup, while lacking evidence for any clear motive for Pedersen, his appeal was successful. Easy clap. Christopher Pedersen was innocent. Dude, Without compelling There's you, a famous picture of him. After he's freed, he's going to go, he gets back home and he goes over to his. Uh, um, his neighbor to celebrate, and the press catch him like with two bottles, right? They they designed a new dr- or they named a new drink after him. He's carrying a bottle of Explorer and a bottle of I think Bailey's. Yeah, this is the picture, a super famous picture in the media. Uh, vodka Explorer and two bottles of Bailey's. So they turned this into a, a, a like a cocktail named like the Killer in Swedish or Dropparen Trapparen. Two parts of Bailey's and one part of vodka. <laughs> yeah. Evidence it was impossible to retry him, even as he made conspicuously self-incriminating remarks and media appearances, apparently motivated by compensation for his sensationalism. Pedersen died in 2004, leaving behind a frustrating trail of circumstantial evidence and un- Talk to a guy fu- gir- Wait, what? ...answered questions. Maybe he had the means. Settergren, who dealt not only in drugs, but also weapons, claimed to have sold Pedersen a revolver which matched the forensic criteria. As for motive, the popular theory goes, ironically enough, Settergren bore a passing resemblance to Palma, and for whatever reason, Pedersen had it out for him like he did the last drug dealer he killed. Nice. As for opportunity, it's plausible he was hanging around the area of the theater and on a dark night could have mistaken Palma for Settergren or someone else. However, the most compelling part of the story is merely how good a story it is. Palma was an extraordinary politician who just wanted to walk the streets of the city he loved with his wife as just an ordinary citizen. One can almost say, if Pedersen did it, that he got what he wanted, dying an anonymous, sudden death in a case of mistaken identity, as if he were nobody at all. But what nah. if there were a more poetic ending? What if the suspect were also more credible, enough to even convince the police in 2020 to name him Palma's killer and close the case? Well, there is Stig Engstrom. Yep. The third eyewitness from the intro, the man whose story just kept changing. Let's take a look at what he said to police the night of the murder. According to the notes, Engstrom had just finished work for the evening and had just come out into the street when he heard what he first thought was an exhaust bag. Fucking sound. However, he soon saw that someone was lying on the ground and also that there were people around him. As he passed the alley by Tunnelgotten, he looked there. Against a lighted wall, he saw a man in his 20s wearing a dark blue jacket. A couple notes on Engstrom's timing and position. According to this telling, he's just outside 44 Sveavagen, roughly 50 to 60 meters away from the shooting when it occurs. And, according to Engstrom, he clocked out at 11.20 p.m. The shooting took place at approximately 11.21 and 20 seconds, so he would have had to clock out in the late seconds of 11.20 at the earliest if he really heard the shooting just outside his office. That is, as long as the time clock is accurate. What? So Engstrom says he heard a bang, then saw Palma surrounded by witnesses, and then saw a man lurking in Tunnelgotten. In fact, that's all pretty reasonable. 
Lars Jepsen, the second eyewitness from the intro, the man who chased the killer up the stairs, testified the same night to police, according to their notes, that he hesitated for a moment whether to rush down to the injured person or whether to pursue the perpetrator. He would later clarify that he crossed to the north side of Tunnelgatten before doing so, a crucial detail because this makes him visible from where Engstrom was standing. This is a vital point in Engstrom's alibi. If he really saw Lars, it makes his guilt very hard to believe. Recall that at the time Lars was standing in that spot, he testified the killer was already bounding up the steps and had made it some distance. To see Lars on the north side of Tunnelgatten would have been very difficult from anywhere other than where Engstrom claimed to be standing. What about the rest of his statement? Well, he makes a few bizarre remarks, but they're ultimately explained with a little investigation. Unfortunately, there's just not enough time for two guys making monthly videos to get into all of what? that here. But if you want to learn more, supporters on our Patreon get access to our podcast, where we discuss things that don't Talk make the cut for videos like this. Link in the description. So Engstrom's story makes enough sense. The problem is he didn't stick to it. First, his position at the time of the murder changed. The earliest police notes imply he claimed he was 50 51. meters away when he heard the shooting, but he later claimed to be much closer, saying he'd walked with quick steps, almost half running, as he was in a hurry to get to the subway. When he was about 20 meters from the intersection at Tunnelgatten, he heard a bang. Part of the discrepancy may be attributed to the police abridging the story in the earliest notes, but there are bigger problems. If Engstrom was just 20 meters away and jogging, it's unlikely Anna, the intro's first eyewitness, Palma's first attendant, or Stefan could have gotten there before Engstrom. Further, Engstrom's jogging makes little sense, as he had plenty of time before the last train. Second, the timing started to get fuzzy, too. In his third conversation with police, Engstrom attempts to explain his failure to register the gunshots appropriately by claiming that he was distracted trying to look at his dark watch. But he'd never mentioned this detail before, and he'd just then clocked out of work. If he was Something worried was about time, yeah. surely he would have taken a look at it then before mistakenly. It's like, it's like all, all of his stuff can be explained by two ways. Either, yeah, he did it, or just, oh, he's just kind of dumb. Assuming he needed to rush to the station. Finally, in successive statements, Engstrom expanded his own involvement in administering first aid to Palma, from casting himself as a helpless bystander to offering advice about how best to position the victim, all the way to actively attempting to turn him on his side. There are other examples, but these are the most conspicuous instances of apparent dishonesty, and they all have one thing in common. A persistent effort by Engstrom Cause. to establish himself- I'm sorry, I, I, I uh, snoozed the ads, but it's caught up with me. Closer to Oopsie. the crime and more involved in the aftermath. Put another way, if he were innocent, Engstrom's first story is perfectly credible. He left work, heard the shot, ran to the scene, and even saw Lars Jepsen where he's supposed yep. to be, confirming the timing. End of story. So why lie? Well, perhaps he got lucky with his first story. Perhaps he'd caught a glimpse of Lars when Lars caught a glimpse of him. <gasps> After all, Lars's description of the killer middle-aged, dark down jacket, something like a cap on his head, and with a wide back, sounds rather like Engstrom, a heavy-set, middle-aged man who wore a dark coat and a cap the night of the crime. According to the 2020 police announcement, the motive is simple. Engstrom craved attention. A middle-aged guy working late nights in a dead-end job who strolled out into the street one night, exhausted and bitter, and saw a man who had it all. He was famous, beloved by many countrymen, a politician who had the confidence, the arrogance, to waltz around at night alone, as if nothing could touch him. But Stig had the chance to put him in his place, so he did. Of course, murder is rarely rewarded with adulation and fame, but scorn and infamy. Unless you kill the Prime Minister of Japan. Check out our video on that assassination okay. after this one. 
So Engstrom fled. Dissatisfied, <laughs> he sought the limelight, telling the police a story that made him seem important. But it wasn't enough. He even complained to his wife the police weren't paying attention to him. In response, he changed his story and inflated his role. So he's got a plausible motive, but what about means and opportunity? It turns out Engstrom had a neighbor acquaintance who collected guns and owned a revolver which fit the forensic search criteria. So he could have had means. As for opportunity, a building employee testified that the time clock, essential to Engstrom's alibi, was one minute fast. Meaning that if Engstrom's time card showed 11.20 p.m., he really clocked out at 11.19. Boom. Much too early for his story to make sense, and early enough to spot the Palmas walking down the street, tail them, and commit the crime. Engstrom begins to look like quite a believable suspect. Except another building employee claimed the time clock was one minute slow which means Engstrom would have really clocked out at 11.21, perfectly in time for his original story to add up and late enough to make it impossible for him to shoot Palma. The police never tested the time clock. Once again, his original story was perfectly believable. So why Stop lie? Stop suspecting me. Well, perhaps the police are right about Engstrom's character, even if he didn't kill Palma. He was an early arrival to a freshly murdered prime minister, the but was ignored so by police on account of lacking any useful information. So he changed his story and exaggerated his role to gain attention. Simple and believable. In effect, this motive cuts both ways, explaining his behavior whether he's guilty or innocent. In fact, most people on both sides of his case point to his attention-seeking as the primary motive for his behavior. Yet again, a frustratingly inconclusive theory. But while the case for Engstrom's guilt is riddled with holes, it has some convincing moments, perhaps most of all because it offers an even more poetic ending than Patterson. An extraordinary man of great importance walks the streets alone, pretending to be ordinary. Not only does he die an anonymous death, a sort mm. of wish ironically granted, he's gunned down by his polar opposite. An ordinary man who thought with the pull of a trigger, he could change his fate, <laughs> become extraordinary. Become legendary. And here we are, almost 40 years later and thousands of miles away, still talking about the lowly Stig Engstrom. Whether Palma was killed by a villainous secret agent, a hapless drug addict, or a hopeless loser, now the story there's a 30 of his death is a fascinating one. Nah. Of course, there's the extraordinary drama of it all. Oh. Walking alone on a cold, dark February evening, the shadowy gunman slipping away into the night, the police blunders, and the many compelling and bizarre suspects. Palma was a man of contradictions. A rich man working for the poor, a powerful individual working for group solidarity. Okay. But so was Sweden, uh, a nation which mid. preached the obligation of each to his neighbor while opting for neutrality you learn and shirking that Not responsibility already. on the world stage. Because liberal democracy is full of these contradictions. Liberalism preaches universal and alienable rights, yet it must tolerate differences between countries lest we attempt to police the world. And democracy prizes the voice of the individual even as it seeks to bring us together in coexistence and compromise. What's more, democracy promises that all democracy are equal. Democracy manifests. Even as it regards some, like Palma, as special. Still a citizen, but something more. While others, like Engstrom, may still yearn, perhaps violently, to be something greater than yet another citizen in the crowd. Uh, Yurt, thanks for 72 months, six years aware. Cleve, thanks for the 32 months. Why would he have a gun with him at work? I think, so there's, they made a show out of this where they said, well, if he did do it, how could he have done it? I can't remember why he had it at work though, just lying in his desk or something. The cop, they, I shit you not, what the cop said when they presented him as the most likely killer was, well, he must have had a gun. Because he shot the, the guy was shot, so therefore we conclude he must have had a gun. Like literally, that's like what they said. 
They just couldn't explain it. But the idea was that he, it's, it's so far-fetched. The idea was he had a friend who owned a gun that could have been the gun. And they, they acquired the gun and they did shooting tests, but the tests were inconclusive because too much time has passed. But it's really far-fetched. I don't think Battery it was Battery gunman him. slipping. Um, uh, yeah, I don't think it was him. I, okay, I, I didn't mean to shit on the video, but I wish they would have put more uh, emphasis on all this stuff because there were like 20 witnesses to this. So they, they cut like a bunch of people here. There was like so a bunch of people standing and they all had different opinions. But one thing that almost everyone had in common, even the police that show up, no one recognized this guy. No one recognized this pain. Or they said that they didn't even see him. Like, no one said they saw him. Or, like, maybe one person did. I don't know. Like, almost no one, none of the witnesses say they saw him here. Which, then you could explain two ways, right? Either he was the killer and he ran away. Or, and this is what I really think happened. I think this guy was a total pussy wimp. And he sees all the commotion and he takes a step back. And then afterwards, he just makes up this bold story where he was on site and he was helping out with, like rescuing efforts and stuff um so i think there is another guy that had opportunity and uh, motive and means he was registered as having uh, bought a 357 gun uh, and then later when cops asked for it he said he lost it or sold it he lived in the area and he was uh he hated uh, palma he had a lot of money in the stock market and this prime minister, they implemented like an extra tax on stock stuff uh, the day before he was killed. And that implementation made the stock market crash. So the guy had a lot of money in stocks and he lost a fuck ton of money because of this prime minister. The day before the guy was shot. So he like opportunity means and everything. I don't know if it was him, but yeah. Uh, I, I really find this murder super fascinating. I can't, can't ever drop it. The only reason I brought it up now again is because I got a book and I read it while I was traveling in Japan. So I was just like fresh in my memory. There's a best of internet daily dotes. There's the new unusual memes. This thing looks insane. I'm...